Good morning. Um, my name is Matt Meyer, and uh, I don't know if you know or have noticed that Teresa Turner is not with us, making this the uh, oil, all male, all European uh, led forum on China, <laughs> Africa, and capitalist destruction of the planet. <clears throat> Welcome, and it's good of you to be here at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Um, in addition to the fact that, as it says in the program, I do blog uh, fairly regularly for wagingnonviolence.org. For those of you who don't know, uh, I'm an editor and author with Africa World Red Sea Press, and I also work politically with the group War Resisters, War Resisters League in the States, but internationally, uh, the group War Resisters International, which in fact is joining together with many of the, the nonviolence uh, and peace internationals to hold its first major triennial uh, convocation in Africa in July of 2014. So that's a gathering that many people around the continent working on grassroots social change uh, are gathering for and gearing up for just a year from this July. So it's a great honor and pleasure to, to welcome you and to have two key speakers to really lead us off on what I hope will be a dialogue today uh, about not China in Africa, you know, in, in some ways, uh, we have this uh, competing uh, panel with colleagues and friends uh, downstairs on BRICS, which side are they on? It's not on China in Africa, though that will be covered by us, but it's China, Africa, and the capitalist destruction of the planet. So given that, it's a great honor and pleasure to have two key speakers. We'll hear first from Richard Smith of the Institute for Policy Research and Development in London, and also, as he wants me to introduce him, as a carpenter builder. Now that's good because then we have uh, uh, following him Fred Magdoff, who is of course professor of soils at the University of Vermont. Uh, it would be the University of Vermont that would have a professor of soils. <laughs> and uh, Every land grant university has more than one. For those who don't know, they don't have more than one Fred Magdoff, who is the author also of Building Soils for Better Crops and editor of the important Hungry for Profit uh, Agribusiness Threat to farms, food, Farmers, Foods, and the Environment. So without further ado, please help us welcome Richard and Fred, China, Africa, and the Destruction of Everything. Oh, sorry, sorry, man. Thanks, Matt. Um, uh, thanks, people, for coming, getting here so early on a Sunday morning. Okay, so um, I, I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to talk about is the, the economic dynamic of China, how this makes this country, uh, this economy different than the kind of regular capitalism in the world, and, uh, and what it's, and, and then I'll, I'll uh, uh, finish up with a little bit of the implications of China's uh, economic development overseas from China, and then segue into uh, Fred. So I think we'll kind of cover the basis here. Okay, so in short order, China has become the main driver of planetary ecological destruction in, in, in uh, many uh, respects, worse in, in some respects even than America, still the world's largest economy. So why is it that China's state capitalism or what I would call bureaucratic collectivist capitalism, and I'll explain why, why I say that in a bit, um, worse than sort of normal capitalism in the U.S. What's, the, what's going on here? China's proposal last week to buy um, uh, Smithfield Foods, one of America's biggest meat packers, uh, that's armor and farmland and some others, for $4.7 billion, billion dollars illustrates this, uh, the, the contradictions of China's bureaucratic collectivist capitalism and its dire implications for China and the whole world. On the one hand, this purchase is emblematic of uh, China's stunning economic success. Market reforms powered um, uh, breathtaking double-digit growth for three decades, transformed what, what, uh, China from, what, from a stagnant uh, Stalinist, Maoist, and poverty uh, economy into the workshop of the world, a, a confident quasi-capitalist dynamo, a $4.4 trillion economy, a nearly $3 trillion trade surplus, a growing middle class, and did all that in just three decades. China is now the world's biggest cell phone market, the most internet users, the largest car market, the world's most extensive high-speed rail network, the biggest airports, entire cities get built practically overnight, 
China is now the largest exporter, surpassing um, uh, Germany, the world's second largest economy, also surpassing Germany. It's now the biggest, uh, the world's also the world's biggest uh, foreign investor, uh, biggest in Germany, among other places. It's now the, even got the world's most tourists. So China's created a whole new industries from scratch, biotechnology, space travel, solar and wind power, nanotechnology. Uh, it's true, they copied a lot of this stuff from the West, but they've created these industries in, in their own country there without help from the West. Um, plus, China powered right through the 2008 crisis, almost unscathed, took those 20 million migrant workers that were laid off by capitalist firm closures in, in uh, Guangdong and so forth, and put them right back to work building China's infra infrastructure in, in the space of a few, a few weeks and months. And now China uses, uses a huge foreign exchange reserve, is, is buying up and investing in mines in Peru, Afghanistan, uh, uh, oil fields, oil and gas lines in Turkmenistan, Myanmar, Sudan, Iraq, hundreds of dams and hydroelectric projects around the world, farmland in Mozambique and the Amazon, buying up uh, Malaysian, Indonesian, New Guinea forests, uh, European countries, Greece's main port, uh, Piraeus, it bought 10% of Heathrow Airport, Canadian oil company, Canuck, for $15.1 billion, uh, European and American companies, Volvo, Hummer, uh, Club Med, it's got an offer on, and now Smithfield Farms. And they also loan money to governments to gain access to markets. China lends more money internationally to, to governments than the World Bank. So that gives you some scale of the incredible ascent of China and the world in the space of just three decades. It's really pretty uh, incredibly uh, uh, breathtaking. On the other hand, the main reason why the Chinese are buying Smithfield as well as farmland in Africa is that they can't produce safe food at home. Uh, according to the government, 70% of its rivers and lakes are polluted. Almost half of these contain water that is, by government standards, unfit for human consumption. In one study, 55% of the water in the 200 largest cities in China rated fairly poor to extremely poor. Vast swaths of the far of farmland have been irrigated with industrial wastewater because the freshwater wells are exhausted or, uh, uh, or too polluted to use. Huge industrial chemical accidents happen uh, pr practically weekly. Uh, leaked into rivers, benzene, P xylene, aniline from chemical plants, coal to chemical plants, especially, uh, uh, <clears throat> and plus companies just dump the stuff wherever they want, legally, often and typically upstream from cities like, um, uh, like Shanghai. Uh, uh, always upstream from the East China Sea, which is, which is uh, dying on the, along its coast. Half the rice sold in southern China is contaminated with cadmium which is an incredible carcinogen. Thousands of dead pigs people saw floating down the river, down the Huangpu River through Shanghai. Uh, decades of food contamination scandals. In 2008, melamine uh, contamination of baby formula killed six people and sickened 300,000. Uh, today, there's, it's just gone on and on. Glow-in-the-dark meat, rat meat pa passed off as mutton. Even diseased carcasses have been sold as meat. Restaurants regularly use recy recycled gutter oil to fry food. China is now the world's main pharmaceutical producer, so I wouldn't buy drugs if I were you. So world markets are being flooded with fake medicines, including fake cancer drugs, fake supplements. Uh, so it's a good time to say just say no to drugs. Uh, government concedes that there are at least 459 what they call cancer villages around industrial clusters of polluting factories where almost everyone is sick. Uh, <clears throat> cancer mortality is up 80% in 30 years, and cancer is now the leading cause of death in Beijing. There are villages uh, where all the children are lead poisoned. Some Chinese try to grow organic food. The Communist Party cadre have special organic farms for themselves. Thank you. Uh, Chinese tourists regularly clean out baby formula on shelves from New Zealand to Amsterdam. Wealthy Chinese basically are just trying to do everything they can to move out of China. They're moving to, uh, new, to America, Canada, and so forth. Export business executives are leaving China in droves. You can not hardly be surprised given the air. And the irony is that China is importing safe food from the West. This is a big bundle, uh, making a big bundle for Western food companies. China is importing safe food from the West while exporting tainted food to the West. This is a great, this is a great uh, uh, profit opportunity here. But no one can escape the air. 
the Chinese bourgeoisie can, can uh, shelter themselves to a certain extent. They build tents, huge tents, over private schools in Beijing to escape the air. China's air pollution is the worst in the world. 17 of the 20 worst polluted cities are in China. Uh, China burns more coal. China burns more coal, I'll say this slowly, than all the rest of the world combined. So now China is the main driver of uh, 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 global warming. Air pollution is killing one point by government uh, concession admission, 1.2 million Chinese a year, even killing trees in Japan. Coal burn is raining, burning is raining down mercury around the globe, poisoning and changing the chemistry of entire oceans. And did I mention that the uh, the Baofa, who the suddenly rich Chinese are almost are, are also almost single-handedly <clears throat> wiping out many of the last. Uh, the world's last major me megafauna, tigers, elephants, rhinoceros, sharks, some bears, and other creatures. China's own native animals were exterminated centuries ago, like the Yangtze, uh, and, and the latest, the Yangtze uh, uh, dolphin uh, was declared extinct uh, a couple of years ago. China is now the world's largest market for illegally traded wildlife. In April, a Chinese boat ran aground in the Philippines, and in its hold, they found 400 boxes, that's 10 tons, of frozen pangolins. What's a pangolin? It's a scaly anteater. They've completely exterminated these creatures from China, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. The Chinese eat them, along with a lot else. They're driving sharks to near extinction for shark fin soup, wiping out swallows for bird's nest soup, and even seahorses, giraffe bone marrow. The last Java rhinoceros was killed just a few weeks ago. China is also wiping out the last tropical forests of Southeast Asia and Africa. 90% of the uh, uh, logs exported from Mozambique, 70% from Gabon and Cameroon, with astonishing speed. They're wiping out habitats for um, orangutans. It's the largest importer of tropical lumber in the world, and it used to go to make uh, uh, junk, cheap flooring <coughs> for the British and the Americans and, uh, and uh, furniture and so forth. But today, 94% of that is for domestic consumption. They're even leveling uh, uh, large swaths of Siberia's huge temperate rainforest. A lot of that goes to IKEA, by the way, which manufactures a huge amount of its products in China. And IKEA, as I mentioned in an earlier talk, is the third largest consumer of lumber in the world. This is also depressing. I'll stop. Uh, at current <laughs> rates, E.O. Wilson, the Harvard biologist, says half the world's great forests have already been leveled and half the world's plant and animal species by, may be gone by the end of the century. There's a panel going on, uh, on at this very same time on catastrophism. I, don't, I fail to see what these people cannot see. If this isn't a catastrophe, what is a catastrophe? Well, what's going on? Why is this? Why can't the Chinese stop pollution, stop destruction of the environment? Why is China destroying the world? I'll tell you why. First of all, of course, the numbers, the huge numbers, the huge size of China's population and the impact it has on global resources and pollution as China joins the global market economy. In the 1980s, when there were only around five and a half billion people, the World Watch uh, Institute calculated that of these, there were only about 1.1 uh, billion what they called mass consumers, that is people who uh, in the industrialized countries like the US, Europe, and Japan, um, who, who uh, consumed, who, you know, uh, it had incomes of about 7,500 a year. They uh, dined on meat and processed food and had enjoyed air conditioning and appliances and cars and airplanes and the throwaway products and so forth like that. They were consuming at that time around 80% of the world's marketed resources. Well, now the Chinese have added another 1.3 billion with maybe 300 or so million of those um, middle class consumers coming on stream and they're looking to consume the other 80%. So the problem is China is hitting its stride as a consumer economy just as the world is running out of resources, running up against tipping points of global warming, resource exhaustion, and species extinction. So China's entrance in, into the market has put huge pressure on demand and generates huge pollution. Um, uh, I passed around a couple um, tables. You can look at these here. The first one here. Okay, uh, this is from uh, the Earth Policy Institute. It's, a t it's his annual consumption of key resources in China and the U.S. latest year with projections to 2035, okay, compared to world production, to current world production. Okay, so just look down here at oil. China in 2035 will consume, it, it's consuming about uh, 9 uh, million barrels a day today versus the U.S. is 19. In, in, uh, <clears throat> In 2035, China is expected to consume 85 billion million barrels a day. That's compared to current 
world oil production, world consumption of 86 billion. That is, China is in 2035, if China just keeps growing at 8% a year, which is what it's growing at right now, it's been growing faster, 10, 12%, but it's just growing at around 7.8, 8% uh, a, a year. If they just keep it at that rate, their rate of growth will, will, will drive them to consume all the, all, basically all the, equivalent to all the, world we the oil we produce in the world today. Uh, that is just staggering. China is going to also consume, and China is 20% of the world population. It's also going to consume, at, by 2035, 69% of cur current world grain production, 62% of current world meat production, 63% of current world coal consumption, 35% of current world uh, um, steel consumption, and 84% of current world uh, paper consumption. So the first question that nobody asks, the capitalist economists, capitalists, they just never ask, like, where is all this going to come from? Well. Um, that's the first problem. That's why the Chinese are buying up the planet, and that's just China. What about the rest of the four-fifths of humanity? What are they going to consume in that time? The second page I gave you is this uh, page that says China's environmental nightmare. It's a study from Deutsche Bank, which analysts conclude that um, barring extreme reforms, if China's, even if China's economy slowed to just 5% per year, its annual coal consumption would rise uh, to 6 billion tons by 2022 from the current level. Car ownership is expected to increase to 400 million in 2030 from the current 90 million. With those two figures, it'll be difficult for the government to reduce national average of parts per million of, of uh, uh, microparticles, um, air pollution that's small enough to enter the bloodstream. The current average is 75 and uh, it's going to reach 900 milligrams. And this is uh, by, uh, by 2022, I guess, 2025. So the comparison there is China in, in, in yellow. I don't know. I, I gave you a black and white copy. It's the lighter shade is China. And this is the UK, the US. And so, you know, you've seen the pictures in the Times, you know, of China, Beijing and uh, Shanghai. Um, uh, it's pretty uh, horrific. Uh, uh, it was horrific when I was there in the early 90s. But anyway, OK. So, so that's just, that's just an, the impact of China's entry into the market as a, as a, as a kind of quasi-capitalist country. The market dynamic, the change from Mao, what, you know, the, the problem is, um, that's the, f uh, I'm going to skip it, that's the first problem, just the entry into capitalism, that's the first problem, but beyond this, China's impact is especially destructive, more so than regular capitalism, because of the specific nature of China's hybrid bureaucratic collectivist capitalist mode of production. I know that's a handful, I'm sorry, uh, but a uh, mouthful, but um, anyway, that's what it is. You can call it communist capitalism if you want, but I don't like to taint the word, but still. Essentially, a, a, a production for market plus bureaucratic property and surplus extraction and police state. Deng Xiaoping geared the Chinese economy to produce for market. He introduced um, a competition to force domestic industry to advance, brought in foreign investment, technology, subjugated workers to capitalist exploitation, privatized some of the economy. But crucially, he kept the Communist Party ownership of all the land, most of the economy. State-owned sector dominates the, still dominates the commanding heights of the economy. Heavy industry, military mines, rails, energy, autos, aviation, airlines, shipping, shipbuilding, telecom, banks, finance, that's all still state-owned. It's overwhelmingly dominant in China's economy. State planning still rules, although it, they don't call it planning exactly, but they still have, they still have five-year targets for various things. The state decides what they want to do in, the, in this economy. They de facto plan the economy by allocating investments, deciding which industries to develop, which to phase out. The state directs urban planning, infrastructure, construction. They, uh, the state uh, hothouses industries at once, sunsets industries at once. Um, it creates transportation, forces job creation to keep unemployment down. So there are no urban slums in China, like the rest of the world. No extensive homelessness in China. The state owns most of the economy, and the Communist Party owns the state. There's no private property, there's no mass privatization of the state sector like in Russia in the 90s, and there's no separation of state and uh, civil society and capitalism, no independent courts, no impartial judiciary. Well, this poses a whole different dynamic uh, for China's economy. If you want, um, um, uh, if you, if, um, 
if you want a comparison, I would say look at the antebellum South in, um, in the U.S. There you had southern planters who produced cotton, tobacco, almost entirely for a world market. But they did so with slave labor, so it was a kind of capitalist slave system mode of production. This gave the economy, obviously, as we know, a very different dynamic from capitalism in the North, based on free labor in the North, with heavy, heavy supervision costs, sharp limits to potentials for productivity increase, and so on. And this system has many implications that, obviously, we still deal with today. So I'm just using that as an analogy to show you why, why this system, this, this hybrid bureaucratic collectivist system, um, bureaucratic collectivist capitalist system has a quite different dynamic than normal capitalism. It's a lot like capitalism in some ways, a lot like bureaucratic collectivism in other ways, but it has its own unique um, uh, specific dynamic. Okay? On the one hand, the centralized economy, centralized surplus extraction um, uh, by a collective ruling class of 86 million Communist Party cadre, uh, this this uh, uh, this kind of system has has enabled them to have huge advantages in terms of their development. First of all, police state capitalism, the combination of expropriated free labor and ferocious police state uh, control, has created probably what is the most systematic and ruthless system of labor exploitation in world history. Mao ran a police state, but he couldn't fire workers. That's very crucial. Um, Deng smashed the iron rice bowl and opened the Chinese workers up to systematic and, and ruthless exploitation by foreign and domestic capitalists that could be fired at will because they created this kind of economy within the economy of a private sector capitalism, foreign investors and so forth. So workers could be driven out of the state sector and into this private sector. It gave them an op option to do that, whereas before under Mao they didn't have any private sector. There was nowhere for workers to go, so they couldn't fire them. So. Uh, it had that, that had a different uh, dynamic, which I could explain to you, but I won't do it right now. Um, so the the combination of capitalism plus police state has given them the the best of both worlds for employers. This has made it possible to squeeze workers as never before in history. In the 80s and 90s, China set the set the the world floor for cheap labor, what was called the China Price. There's a book with that title which I recommend people look at if you're interested in. The underpayment of farmers drives, drove uh, desperate peasants to flee the land to take up sweatshop jobs in export zones at 12 to 16 hours a day, uh, semi-militarized factories and low wages, low wages and so forth. China had the worst, had and has the worst health and safety conditions in the world. Factory fires all the time, just let one last week, killed 120 workers. 6,000 plus miners a, a year a die in coal, fi coal fires, coal mine, uh, collapses. Foxconn workers jump out of the windows to commit suicide because they can't take the pace and despair. Workers work till they're blind to death, the child labor, forced overtime, sexual abuse, all backed up by a police state to crush labor organization with no recourse for labor. This engine of capital accumulation has earned China huge foreign reserves, enriched cadres and capitalists alike. And I, I won't go into the detail, but since the last, over the last decade, there's been tremendous resistance to this, worker resistance, and so they have fought back a lot against this. The Honda strikes, and people probably know about that stuff, but many throughout China, tremendous resistance all over the place, and that has, that has to a certain extent, countered this, uh, this ruthless exploitation, but that's, a, a, that's a, a, another uh, avenue for discussion. Uh, secondly, this state capitalism enables the state to pursue a nationalist industrial policy far more efficient than the U.S. Uh, US kind of, kind of capitalism with um, where they needed to, to in, in the 2008 recession, they just pumped $585 billion to fund construction infrastructure. They put 20 million unemployed to work. They, they built bridges and high-speed rails and Olympic stadiums and solar power plants and whole cities in record time. State-backed investment enabled China to mobilize capital, plan economic development, create whole new industries from scratch. State-backed industrial es espionage. Uh, Chinese military and technocrats are recruited to to uh, rip off corporate secrets from uh, from the West. They invite Boeing and Japanese train uh, builders to, uh, to produce in their country, and then they rip off the technology. It's a little payback for the opium wars, you know. It's a mm. tip for tat here. Mm. And in recent years, they've become very, especially proficient at hacking into Western corporate computers to steal technologies. Globally, China's state-backed investment gives the Chinese companies a big edge in global competition. Combination of layers of multiple state-owned companies can work together. Not only to uh, they they can import. 
thousands of Chinese lo uh, low-wage workers, like in Libya or various other places, to build infrastructure projects. China National Petroleum extracts the oil, while China National Railways builds the rails to get the oil out of the country. Power plants to support all the, the mining and the rails, they build to support the oil extraction. So Libya, Greenland, China's looking to develop Greenland. They're going to bring in everything, the capital, the technology, the workers, because Greenland has no workers, hardly any people there. So state-backed industry can do that. They can flood the world markets with below uh, market goods because they can subsidize their, their, their uh, industries. State complicity and tolerance, if not actual support for uh, counterfeit products, enables Chinese industries to rip off technology, flood markets, not with just fake DVDs and Marlboros and Gucci handbags, but entire companies. There are at least 22 fake Apple stores in China, Apple, complete with the Apple logo and the T-shirts. and There are fake IKEA stores, fake fossils, fake driver's license. You can go on, for underage kids, they have 75 bucks, they can go online for Nanjing and get fake driver's license with the, all the, you know, the, what do they call it, little, uh, little ma magic thing, you know, the, the pictures, of course, but then they have the little thing they put on your credit cards, you know. They, they can do all of that, you know. Fake military hardware and electronics to sell out to the Americans. That's so great. I love it, you know. So our, our American hardware, is, military hardware is made in China. Almost $3 trillion trade surplus gives China state corporate bidders huge advantage to outbid Western companies, snap up African oil and Australian, Canadian nickel and South American copper, Iraqi oil fields, Afghani copper mines. Thank you very much for the Americans managing us for this. Western, auto, Western automakers and so on and so forth. All this is bureaucratic collectivist to a great extent, not capitalist. It's the max demand is not just profit, but to build up Chinese state industry, to augment this Chinese state national power, and above all, to defend the, and secure the supremacy of the Chinese Communist Party. But there are huge problems and irrationalities in this, too. Uh, first of all, I, will, I'll, I won't go too long here. How long do I have here? Okay. Um, if efficient exploitation itself presents a dilemma because the engine of capital accumulation based on low-wage workers makes it hard for these workers to buy much in China itself. So they can't save as much as they do. They have to save as much as pot. They, you know, they also trash the, the social security system and so forth in the city so they can make the workers um, uh, uh, exploitable, more exploitable to capital. So, so workers have to save on their own to pay for schools and medical care and old age and so forth. So it's hard for China to develop an internal market. Um, and uh, it, it relies tremendous amount on uh, infrastructure construction and um, on, uh, on exports. So that's a big problem. Um, secondly, the, the, and this gets more interesting, the dispersed ownership of the industrial uh, of industry gives rise to, to um, uh, See, I, may I, I'll explain this a little bit more. China's Communist Party, see, China's Communist Party is the collectivist owner of China's economy, okay, in toto. They're, they're party bureaucrats, they're assigned, they are rewarded on the basis of their, their position in the nomenclature or someplace, but, but uh, so they get, a, they get a housing and so forth assigned to them and cars and this, that, and the other. But they, but they do not, China, this, this is why it's a mistake to see China as a capitalist country in this sense, because China's cadre do not own shares in enterprises. State enterprises are not stock, are not stockholding enterprises out where you can buy and sell shares. A cadre in Beijing cannot buy a share in an industry in uh, Shenzhen or Kunming or, something, or Guangdong. They can't, they can't do that. They, the cadre can only profit from, see the deal is the cadres get, it's complicated, I, I don't have time to explain it all. I did a dissertation on this. Uh, in between being a carpenter build, I did a dissertation in Chinese and transition of capitalism in China at UCLA. Carpenter so, dissertation building. Where right, yeah. So um, uh, the Chinese um, uh, cadres are uh, assigned to a particular unit of production or, or uh, enterprise, and, and they can milk certain surpluses out of that because the, the incentive system is set up such a way that you can keep, they gave the cadres the incentive to keep surpluses in their bailiwick that they generate over and above the profit, so they, get, they have a profit sharing system with the central government, right? So there's huge incentive for people in the local bailiwick to develop uh, industries. So this has given rise to a, ra a very unusual dynamic in China. So for example, like in the United States, there are three domestic auto builders. You know them, General Motors, Chrysler, Ford, right? In China, there are 170 
auto, domestic auto builders. They're different companies. They're, all, they're owned by different provinces and different local governments all over the place. Some of them only make a few thousand cars. But the point is, if, you want, if you're a cadre in, uh, in uh, Kunming and you want to benefit, profit from the auto industry, the only way you can do it is build your own auto industry because you can't invest in the auto industry in Shanghai or Jiangxi or Guangdong. You have to have your own industry. So there's tremendous duplication across the whole country. Tremendous effort to, to, to do that. Almost every province has its own airline because you have, want to profit from airline business that's what you got to do you got to create your own airline so and it's you know it's the same with it, this was a this was a perennial problem in the old days under uh, Mao but a, a little bit different but there's tremendous uh, uh, duplication and dispersion of industry all over the country so um, so because these individuals can't vet, invest in Beijing Jeep or Jili or BYD in Hong in, in uh, Guangdong they have to set up their own industries build them themselves sell them locally and try to keep other competitors out of their markets so this leads to huge, massive duplication throughout the economy. The headline of the of Wall Street Journal, can you imagine this headline in the New York Times, in, in, in New York, headline of the Wall Street Journal was, China can't, this was uh, March 2013, China can't curb steel mills. Production rises 9.8% as steel makers defy Beijing's effort to reduce capacity. Can you imagine that? I mean, Okay, <clears throat> China, the headline was, China can, cannot curb steel mills. Production, I should have brought the headline. Rise, production rises 9.8% as, as steel makers defy Beijing's effort to reduce capacity. That would be like having a, like an auto, in, or a steel maker in, in America, like just keep producing steel when they can't sell it anymore. Well, who buys it? Well, they borrow money from the government, local government borrow money from the government, they buy up all the steel, and they keep the profits. Be, and, then they, and then the banks loan them the money because they're state-owned banks, and it's all, you know, it's one hand, out of one pocket and, and into the other. This is, how, this is how irrational the economy gets set up. So whole towns get built. There's tremendous investment in all kinds of things, real estate especially. Whole towns get built. There's no one living in them because they get the money to, to build the town, and so they build the town. There might even be anybody there. You know? So there's tendency to endless overproduction, not boom crash like in capitalism, but be, and, and also state-owned state industries don't necessarily fail. This is not capitalism. You know? They could be inefficient, so far, but they don't necessarily fail. Sometimes government let companies go bankrupt, like uh, Bear Stearns, but most of the time, like Goldman Sachs and Citibank and AIG. Failure doesn't mean failure uh, in China. Uh, thirdly, out of control corruption. Uh, inevitable uh, um, since uh, which, w once China opened up to the West, Deng said it was okay to, for cadres to get rich. And of course, it, you know, as Deng said, well, someone will have to get rich first. Somebody has to be the capitalist. So who would get rich first? Who would that be? I wonder. It was, of course, the cadres who were in control of everything, and, and, and they were presented with the mother of all moral hazards. They were supposed to jump into the sea of commerce and promote capitalism, but they were not themselves supposed to loot state industries and embezzle pension funds and take bribes from foreign investors. And, but who else would do that? Because they're the only ones that had control of everything. So that's exactly what, what they did. Nancy and I wrote an article in, in a monthly review in 2000 on primitive accumulation in China and, and Russia. I, I, I would urge people to take a look at that. Um, uh, what's the title, Nancy? <laughs> <laughs> Tell him the title. Tell me the title. The Necessity of Gangster Capitalism. Yeah. Right, the necessity of gangster capitalism. You gotta have gangster capitalism to create capitalism. You know, you have to expropriate, you have to loot all this stuff and get it in the hands of these would-be capitalists. Because before 1978, no Chinese country had anything. They didn't have any property, any money, but all of a sudden they got rich. Well, how did they get rich? They like, you know, they just, you suppose they, you know, the capitalist story would be, oh, well, it was out of the trunk of their cars or selling trinkets and whatnot, wristwatches, and that's how they built up their billions and billions of dollars. You know, like Hu Jintao, you know, like 2.7 billion he saved out of his salary and, I mean, please, you know. Okay, so, so the mother of all moral hazards, these guys become the crooks of all crooks. 90% of nouveau rich Chinese are Communist Party members. Almost every year, the government reports that about $50 billion is lost, smuggled out of China. To stay ahead of the anti-corruption drives, the cadres are endlessly inventive. Uh, and this is a whole, whole, this could be a whole essay in itself. It's really interesting. Consuming this social surplus collectively, only, they, they only work half the month. They feast and they enjoy prostitution and building luxury offices and luxury housing and fleets of Mercedes Benz and lux even luxury prisons. I, I had a talk, I had a picture of that was great. Gambling trips to Macau, their own rooms in Las Vegas, set aside special rooms for the Chinese government cadre, all on company credit card. The deal is, see, it's better for the cadre to consume the, the goodies 
collectively, because that way they can't be accused of, you're telling me to shut up, okay, uh, stop it, okay. They can't be accused of, but it's so interesting, they can't be accused of ripping off the state privately if they consume it collectively. Well, we're all doing it. You know, the Mercedes-Benz belongs to the unit, not to me. I mean, I may drive it all the time, but, you know, right. Okay, so, so the corruption, uh, spending on uh, public funds on private pleasures and gambling, okay, I'll, go, I'll move along here. Uh, b party beer, that's... Um, um, yeah, okay. Um, this corruption is inevitably corrosive to the whole society. That's a big problem. It promotes corruption throughout uh, society. There are actual gangsters and gangs flourishing, and, uh, but it's really the, the moral rot of the whole society. Okay, so that's a third point. Fourth, and I'm almost there, um, resource overconsumption and pollution. Uh, this is a huge, this is to come back to the points I was talking about at the beginning. The state can't regularly force locals to conserve resources and especially to clean up pollution because the local governments are co-owners. These The environment, the, the point is to understand why this doesn't work. You know, the, the, one campaign after another after another against corruption and so forth and try to clean up, but they can't force these guys to clean up because the local party cadres and the provincial party cadres, these guys are all co-owners in this collectivist ownership of the whole economy. So, you know, they can shout all they want from Beijing or they'll send some inspection team down and say, you kind of quit dumping all this stuff in the lake. And so they'll quit dumping it for a few days and when the inspection team goes back to Beijing, they'll start dumping the stuff in the lake again, you know, because they're co-owners and there is no separation of state and civil society. There is no independent. China has an FDA. They have an EPA. They have probably more environmental laws on the books than the United States, but they are systematically ignored because there is no real outside separate court that people can go to dependably. There are courts, so they're fake too. They're, they're courts, they, you, can go, you can go to the courts and you can sue. Sometimes they'll win little victories here or there, but mostly not too much, okay? And are you timing me? Yeah, we are. Yeah. You got a minute. Finish. A minute, okay, all right. So they can't, but this is the most important thing. They can't clean up. In 2007, China ex executed the head of the FDA for taking bribes from drug makers and failing to protect drug safety. Th but things have only gotten worse. The food scandals are becoming more frequent and bizarre. Um, and th so that's the first thing, that the, the co-owners can't be dependent, but you can't get these guys to discipline themselves. And secondly, China won't tolerate any grassroots activists, any unions or any Greenpeace or any activists. So all people can do is protest, and there are, a, there are frequent, like hundreds of thousands of mass incidents every year where people protest because that's the only way they can try it. And they have successfully, to some extent, stopped the, the, the installation of this plant or that plant or so forth, but then they just move it out to the country further away where the resistance is lower. Okay, so um, that brings us to China in the world, where we're going to transition to Fred here. China's neo I'll just say, uh, just in a sentence or two, that China's neo-colonial firms bring the same tendencies at home as they, uh, uh, from home to, the, to Africa and places where they go. They don't care about human rights at home, so they don't, they're happy to team up with the worst thugs and dictators in Africa and Asia and so forth, you know. And because um, the governments are like themselves, no strings attached, no questions asked, no, you know, dealing with, uh, 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 you know, bad press and so forth. Um, so transition, transparency international rates China just below Russia on the bribe payers index. And, um, you know, the, the consequences, workers get terrible health and safety, you know, in Zambia they shot a bunch of miners in 2010 and so forth. Okay, so I have more, but I'll stop there and, um, and we'll go on to Fred. Thank you. I'm going to be over here and I need to give you a little background. Uh, I saw my role, I was going to be third. I saw my role as uh, sort of trying to synthesize the two presentations that were made before me. And, um, and uh, the uh, Teresa, uh, it turned out, as I found out yesterday or the day before, was not going to be able to make it today because she's going to Ecuador today. This is the person that was going to speak on Africa. So I figured if that's in the title, maybe, maybe I should try to find some things. It's not an area. That I, that I have uh, studied specifically, although I'm aware of many of the things that are happening there. And, um, and I have a couple of graphics, which is one of the reasons for using this, and I have some notes that I thought uh, I would uh, read from, because I, I don't have anything. I've got some scribbling prepared here, which is the normal way I do things. 
but uh, there were some things I wanted to, uh, to quote from. Um, by the way, I, I have some questions and, and I think some disagreements on some statements, not, not that many and, and not, uh, not major uh, with regard to, uh, to Richard's uh, comments, but, but I, I won't uh, talk about that now. Uh, one thing I'd, I'd like to, to mention, uh, he was talking about corruption. Of course, uh, China has no corner of the market on corruption. Uh, there is plenty of corruption. Uh, well, we know there's plenty of corruption in the United States, uh, in Latin America, Mexico, and uh, I would say in Africa also. I don't want to pick on Africa as a, um, as a place where governments are, are particularly corrupt, but, but they are quite corrupt, many of them. I'm talking in generalities over, over a huge continent. Uh, so um, uh, obviously it, there are better and worse as there are with uh, Western and, uh, uh, governments as well. Okay, uh, so just in China in general, just give some idea there, I mean, excuse me, Africa in general. This is a, a quote that uh, John and I, John Bellamy Foster, by the way, the latest book, I believe, is uh, What Every Environmentalist Needs to Know About Capitalism, which was written with uh, John Bellamy Foster and myself. And we quoted a, um, a Duke ecologist uh, who had been uh, working in Africa, and uh, he talked about a particular country, a small country that he had visited, Everywhere I went, foreign commercial interests were exploiting resources after signing contracts with the autocratic government. Prodigious logs four and five feet in diameter were coming out of the virgin forest. Oil and natural gas were being exported from the coastal regions. Offshore fishing rights had been sold to foreign interests. An exploration for oil and minerals was underway in the interior. The exploitation of resources in North America during the 500-year post-discovery era followed a typical sequence, fish, furs, game, timber, farming, virgin soils, but because of the usually expanded scale of today's economy and the availability of myriad sophisticated technologies, exploitation of all the resources in the poor developing, uh, in the poor developing countries now goes on at the same time. In a few years, the resources of this African country, he's talking about a specific country, and others like it will be sucked dry. And then what? The people there are, certain, are currently enjoying an illusion of prosperity, but it is only an illusion, for they are not preparing themselves for anything else, and neither are we. So there are, there's a tremendous interest now in Africa from many, many different capitalist countries. The United States only recently, two or three years ago, created an African command for its armed forces. There hadn't been one before that uh, because it saw the strategic importance of Africa, not just because of Al-Qaeda issues in North Africa, uh, uh, but also because uh, uh, Africa, because of the resources that were in Africa and the potential uh, for exploitation of those resources. So there's been this uh, tremendous uh, uh, interest in, in uh, increasing interest in Africa from all countries that are interested in controlling, buying, controlling resources uh, and making money off of uh, investments in other countries, which is the exportation of capital, which is part of capitalism, part of imperialism. So um, one of the things also that's come to play uh, is that you have different types with regard to, to Africa and the Chinese involvement in Africa is you have different types of um, relationships. Okay, there's a standard aid type of relationship which, which went on long before the, even the, this uh, post-Mao era uh, uh, occurred in which there was aid given to countries. It could be direct uh, grants or it could be uh, aid of uh, low interest loans. Sometimes the loans aren't that low interest uh, for development supposedly, uh, but mainly for infrastructure. Uh, and those, those types of aids, by the way, if anyone's interested in the data on it, I found a website called aiddatachina.org. All one word, aid data, so there's two Ds, A-I-D-D-A-T-A, china.org, has a lot of information on the aid that's going uh, from China to Africa. Uh, and it breaks it down in many different ways. There's lots of graphics there that you can use. Uh, and uh, so uh, if, if you're interested in that particular issue. Uh, in the, uh, in 2000, uh, 2011, uh, 
the, the Chinese aid I'm talking about now, not, I'm not talking about all the investments that went to, to China, this is aid that went to, to, to their various forms, uh, was only, uh, was, excuse me, was about uh, $74 billion, um, which, uh, which is a, you know, a fairly good amount, but when you look at the, uh, all of the various countries that are contributing aid, it's not that out of line with the United States, it's not that out of line with Europe, etc. okay? So that it, it is a lot of money and it's being used just the way the United States uses its money, just the way the European countries use their money to try to gain access. In other words, you give aid in order to create connections, to build uh, the ability to have commercial interests, and to gain trust, uh, to build infrastructure, as uh, Richard was saying, that helps you get out things that you want to get out of the country for profit or because you want them in your country. Okay, <laughs> so there's, there are different reasons for, for, uh, for making uh, investments. Um, so, so then you have investments of the state-owned enterprises, these government enterprises, and you have investments in Africa from the Chinese private companies, okay? And you also have, uh, you also have individual activities of uh, individual people who just go uh, on their own or in small groups of people uh, to, uh, to try to make a way in Africa. Some of them open shops. Uh, the uh, 124 people who were arrested uh, a few days ago and are due to be released today in Ghana. These were uh, coal miners from a small, small location in China uh, who were mining in Ghana uh, using uh, machinery versus, you know, heavy machinery versus what the Ghanaian miners were using uh, and causing more pollution for that reason, just, just of the magnitude. Uh, those people are due to be released today, so they said. Uh, this was in The Guardian this morning. And uh, if they will agree to leave their machinery in Ghana, they will be free to go. There were about 160 some odd people involved in this. They're in the story, I believe it was that story, it said there were 10,000 people from this particular area in China in Ghana. I don't know if they were all trying to deal with coal mining or they're doing other things. So there, there are a lot of Chinese in Africa doing, doing uh, many different uh, activities. Um, according to the China Daily in 2000, this is a 2010, um, the direct Chinese investment was uh, about uh, $59 billion in 129 countries. And according to their data, 22% of that was in Africa. So about a quarter, you know, 20% to 25% of what the Chinese are investing abroad. As, as Richard talked about, they, they're, they're trying to buy up Smithfield, and that hasn't gone through yet which is a major pork producer in the United States and other meats. Um, so, but about 20, 25% is, is going into Africa in different, uh, in different ways. Um, okay, there was a decision made uh, to pair with the device to make sure that the number below, <coughs> my God, I, 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 I can't even access this. I have something out here that never has ever appeared before. It's, uh, uh, it's I'm not going to do that. Anyway, um, under the old system of aid, there was a lot of debt that was created. As I mentioned, some of the aid was given in grants, just like the United States does, and some of the aid was given in, uh, in loans. And so uh, the loans uh, that were providing mainly for infrastructure uh, and production projects. Uh, this is a quote from an article. Be Beijing began to experiment with debt equity swaps and lease arrangements to involve Chinese companies in ownership roles on China's former aid projects as they were being privatized. Other Chinese companies looked for profitable new investment opportunities that were opening up with other forms of privatization in, in Africa. Talk, talk about. While, di while diplomacy remains a major purpose of aid, significant reforms in the 1990s and 2000s positions China's official engagement in Africa to bolster China's longstanding the policy that aid should generate, quote, mutual benefit. So the idea is that much of the aid now and much of, uh, of, of the, the loans and, uh, and uh, the direct grants uh, is to help really smooth the way, if you will, 
for the, uh, for the other investments uh, to come in. Okay, so these investments are of many different types. There's a lot of it is in land, uh, and I'll just read you, there's, uh, there's databases uh, on, uh, on land grabs uh, in Africa, which is, which is a major problem, by the way. The Chinese are not the major player in this at all. It's Western Capital, which is the major player in this. A lot of that investment uh, in, uh, in land is either to buy up land or to get long-term leases. Uh, and uh, for 99 years, maybe one dollar a, a hectare or something like that per year. I mean, these are nominal rates, uh, and that's much of that is per, is to produce uh, uh, basically palm oil and jatropha, which is an oil crop for the European market, so they could have green biodiesel <laughs> by throwing African peasants off their lands to have large plantations to grow these types of crops. So, so there are lots of folks investing in Africa. It's been estimated that about 5% of African farmland is under long-term arrangement or ownership of foreigners. Okay, either these, uh, these uh, uh, state entities, United Arab Emirates and uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, or uh, private capital. Okay, so these are just a couple of Chinese ones. They're not particularly egregious, they're not the worst, they're not the biggest, but just let me just read you some of the details. This is from uh, data, there's a whole uh, a spreadsheet uh, of land grabs that people are interested on. Grain, G-R-A-I-N, is a collective, and one of the things that they follow are, is the land grab situation. They do this cooperatively. It's a small cooperative of, of people doing this together. Uh, in uh, 2006, IKO, a subsidiary of Shaanxi Land Reclamation General Corporation, also known as Shaanxi State Farm, signed a, a U.S. $120 million investment agreement with the government of Cameroon, giving it the, I don't think I can pronounce it, a Nangana, a Boko rice station, and a 99-year lease for another 10,000 acres of land, 2,000 hectares there, close to the right far, uh, rice farm and 4,000 hectares in another district and 4,000 hectares uh, in, uh, in the west of the uh, country. The company also has begun trials of rice and maize and also plans to grow cassava. Just, uh, I'll just read you a couple more, just to give you some idea of what's happened. In 2010, ANA reported that the Chinese ambassador to Benin, Geng Wenbing, had announced that a group of Chinese businessmen, having completed its assessment of, of local conditions, were planning to invest in palm oil production in Benin, and would immediately require at least 10,000 hectares of land to begin the development of oil palm plantations. Okay, oil, most of this oil palm is the oil from that. Most of that is going to Europe for the for the uh, biodiesel market. China National Complete Import and Export Corporation. So it's COMPLANT is the, is the acronym, functioned as a foreign aid office for China until 1993. And while it now trades in the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, its controlling shareholder is the State Development and Investment Corporation, the largest state-owned investment holding company in China. The company is involved in a number of construction and infrastructure projects overseas and several agricultural projects. In 2010, its subsidiary, Huahlian International, announced plans to establish a joint venture with Complant and the $5 billion uh, China-Africa Development Fund to set up ethanol projects in various African countries. In three, in the three companies plan to launch the venture in Benin and roll out to other countries in the coming year. The venture will draw on Complant's numeral, numerous recent investments in sugarcane and cassava production, including, by the way, an 18,000 hectare sugarcane plantation in Jamaica, a proposed 4,800 sugarcane and cassava plantation venture in Benin, a 1,300 hectare sugarcane plantation factory in, in Sierra, Sierra Leone in 2006, etc., etc., etc. This goes on in, in Madagascar, in, in Mozambique, etc. Uh, by the way, this is a whole separate issue. We're talking about Africa, but uh, if people are interested in uh, it's interesting that they're investing in sugarcane in Jamaica because Jamaican agriculture was basically destroyed uh, by, by, the, uh, by the agreements uh, with the IMF, uh, which forced it to lower its import duties on food from the United States. 
uh, if anyone is interested in that issue, there is an amazing documentary that was made in about 2001 called Life and Debt, D-E-B-T. And you can get it on DVD, Netflix, I assume, has it. It will. It has other themes, but one of its major themes is the destruction of Jamaican agriculture. And it's, it's a very important video. I, uh, someone asked me to explain how it happens. I said, listen, this, if you want to understand it, just watch this video and you'll see. And there are other things going on in the video. But. So one of the complicating things is that, is that this land that's being taken under control uh, by, the, by the Chinese or joint ventures with Chinese uh, government or private Chinese uh, and Africans is that these are large estates they're being managed as large estates. And so when that happens, it doesn't make any difference really who owns it as far as the effect on the peasantry in Africa. And that is one of the major issues with regard to the land grabs is that people are being displaced from this land. Some of this land is considered to be sort of a wasteland, a swampy area, let's say, or, or, or other types of so-called unused land. But there's no such thing as unused land in Africa. You know, it may have been sparsely settled and may have been used for game and for fish and for other purposes. Um, but, uh, but you're displacing populations of people in order to develop these plantations uh, for capitalist, if you will, size, large scale uh, industrial type of models of, uh, of agriculture. So these investments are, are, are in all sorts of things. Uh, I just wanted to show you a couple of uh, maps uh, of Africa that show just uh, some of, this is why I actually did this if I can get there, and it works, uh, hold on, the computer is not behaving as it should, um, and I don't know if I can get it to do this, but it's so frustrating because I see it right here, and all I need to do is push one button, and I'm not being given the option of doing that. Um, oh, I see. I see this moving up here. Well, that's good. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Can we try this when you talk? What's that? Can we try this when you talk? I always look around my class and say, who's the only person here? So <laughs> <laughs> what I want to do is get Why you talk? Is there a 12-year-old in the room? Year old in the room? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. We got it. We did it. I hope. We didn't. We got it now. Yes, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, so this, I believe, is from the China. I'm not sure if this, no, this is, uh, I've forgotten which website this is from. Well, this gives you some idea of the investments. I believe it's, uh, what's the period of time? I think it says on there. Yeah, since 2000. So this is all recent investments. Since 2010. Actually, excuse, excuse me, 2010. So I said recent, even though I, I mean, I knew it was 2010. Right. Say it. Say it. And uh, I know it's kind of hard to, to read and to, uh, to get at this, but they're different, it's different types of investment, from oil and natural gas, there's uh, hydraulic dams, there's copper, there's uranium, uh, airports, there's airports, there's all sorts. And then it Port shows you, this is showing you whether it's complete, like these, these here in South Africa that have that ring around them, those are completed projects, and the ones that don't have that are incompleted projects. Uh, and this is the estimated, uh, you know, uh, uh, offers, if you will, or, or the, the costs uh, of these things. So it gives you some idea of the, of the vastness. We're not just talking about one small area. We're not talking about, you know, just Ghana you know, because of the gold miners there. Or uh, uh, Richard mentioned the, the coal mine in, in Zambia, right? Yeah. There was also well, a lot of mines in a lot of mines in Zambia last November. The Chinese manager of the coal mine was killed uh, by workers. And uh, this year, I believe, this spring, if I'm not mistaken, either the mine's been closed or something has happened to the mine. The, the Zambians are, are, are not very uh, uh, happy with, with uh, how workers were being treated in that uh, situation. Anyhow, so this gives you just some idea of the distribution of it. I don't know if, the, if there's agriculture on here, even the land, there's uh, water. Manufacturing, you create a I don't, I don't, no. I don't think so. No, it doesn't say this railroad, rail, railroad yeah, yeah. other mining. I don't think the agricultural ones are here. And the agricultural ones, I, as I mentioned, are hard to decipher exactly what, who's doing what, and where, where the products are going from that, or intended to go for, for new, for new uh, projects. Uh, they may, you know, China, as Richard was mentioning, China does import. It is no longer self-sufficient. It's a net importer of food, uh, but it does still produce a lot of food. 
uh, contaminated or not. Uh, and uh, so that it is not a major uh, importer uh, of, I mean, percentage-wise of its food. But in the future, it may very well be. Uh, it has lost a lot of agricultural land to development. Uh, most of that stolen from peasants, by the way, by local uh, county and, uh, and uh, the village leaders who, who actually uh, sold it as if it was their own, uh, for, the, for their own sake and for the coffers of the, of the county uh, budget, if you will. So this is a, uh, um, so anyway, so the, 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 land, this, the land issue is not on here. There is a database that has that if you're interested from grain. If you can't find, I'm having problems finding that, I can send you it or give you the connection. I just wanted to show one other uh, slide. I don't, so I don't have many. Uh, it says it's trying to do it, but it's, it's uh, not behaving very well. Okay, come on. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. okay. So these are, uh, these are uh, special economic zones in Africa that, that have been developed by the Chinese. And so uh, you can see it's not everywhere, uh, but you have the Mauritius, you have uh, in Ethiopia. This is showing you around Addis Ababa. Okay, so this is, this is just a blow up of Addis Ababa and the area around it. And this is near, near uh, uh, Lagos in, uh, in uh, Nigeria. Again, this, these, are, these are zones around that in Nigeria. So the Chinese are experimenting with this. These are Chinese business interests that are doing this. Um, and uh, lots of times, it, as I mentioned, and, and Richard also, it's all confusing. So, some of this is actually private capital, and mm -hmm. some of this is state capital. And sometimes it'll be a mix of the two uh, as, as to what they're doing. So, so uh, I don't think what the Chinese are doing is unusual, except that it's been happening relatively quickly. Uh, that they're, they're trying to play catch up. Western uh, capital has really been the, uh, the controller of mines and oil and resources in, in the develop so-called developing countries, or third, what used to be called the third world. And uh, China wants to make sure that it has the resources available to it if it needs it. Uh, and the other thing is, so there's an issue of you know, controlling mines, let's say, or Smithfield, perhaps, so you can make sure you can get some pork or you get the technology to, to, to do it in China. But there's also the issue of you just have plain ordinary Chinese capitalists who are behaving just like plain ordinary American capitalists or, or French or whatever. And they are trying to, uh, trying to make a buck. And one of the ways to make a buck is to, is to go into a, uh, into a poor country, especially one where there's corruption, where you can get a very good deal. Uh, and the deals on the, the land, as I mentioned, are, are sometimes extraordinary. Uh, they could only have been done with corruption. There's no other explanation for how cheap the land has gone for or is being rented for than, uh, than some corruption. So um, I don't, so I, anyway, I think I better, I better quit. I, uh, I probably uh, said more than I knew, if you will. Uh, and uh, <laughs> this is, uh, as I said, this is not my area. Uh, but uh, but I have been interested in the whole issue of, uh, of exploitation of Africa's resources uh, in general, not necessarily the interaction and the interrelation with China. Um, and uh, uh, let me quit at that point. Great, thank you. So um, let's begin a robust uh, conversation. I guess I'll, I'll say this. Um, because I, I, I'm not one shy to stop people when it feels like they're going on, but I did feel like the amount of information that both yeah. of you provided was top rate, so I, I may have uh, let things go a little long, but I still think we have good time for conversation. And I think uh, I just want to underscore as someone who, who uh, has focused on uh, Africa uh, and the Pan-African whole, uh, not just one segmented area of specialty, that I think you know what Fred said about China not really behaving particularly differently, other than the fact that it's a particular speed and ferocity uh, and, and resources that in some ways, you know, there's a debate within African circles about whether it's a colonial relationship or a neo-colonial relationship, but in some ways that's irrelevant, uh, you know, and, and it's about speed and timing. Uh, you know, with uh, debating now uh, whether there are approximately 500,000 or 700,000 Chinese throughout the continent, 
approximately 900 Chinese companies throughout the con continent. You look at those numbers, they're not huge in some ways. They're large, but they're not, you know, uh, you know, someone argue what a, a colonial occupying space would be. Uh, but the effect, and this is where Fred's point becomes so key, the effect on what it means in terms of local populations and what it means in terms of indigenous control and power is essentially the same as colonial or neo-colonial in any other form. Uh, I, I will say also, I, I just grabbed from PM Press, so I also work with uh, a reprint. They did a history of Pan-Africanism, CLR James classic, because I do believe some of those classics uh, are still useful in understanding uh, the work, so I, I do still refer back to Nkrumah and Secretary and James and others uh, uh, along with these guys' recent works. So let's hear who wants to start us off with some questions and comments. Please tell us who you are. Say your name. Sure. My name is David Holmberg. Um, listening to this and, uh, you know, thinking of some other things I've seen in the media recently, uh, it's bringing to mind, uh, you know, concern to what extent is the, uh, the relations of strength out of relation to the uh, share of the imperialist pie in the world. In other words, to what extent are the uh, inter-imperialist contradictions emerging exactly in the, the same dynamic that, uh, you know, Lenin was talking about in the early, early part of the um, 20th century? And, you know, is there some longer range uh, uh, dynamic of war in this, um, uh, in these developments? Okay, please. Again, yeah, Andrew, tell us your name. Yeah, my name is Anthony. Yes, um, I'm with the uh, AAPRPGC. Sure, sure. Um, Not everyone necessarily knows what those initials are. Yeah, yeah, all African People's Revolutionary Party, GC. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, my, um, my question or comment is that um, with this uh, intense scramble, for control of the resources of Africa. And it seems like from, uh, from a comment uh, that one of you made that a similar thing is going on in China, which is no, why it's no longer self-sufficient in food, that with this exploitation of resources, uh, you, know, um, you know, the implications are in addition to uh, the uh, environmental degradation, that it's gonna be more difficult for the for the Africans to be uh, to be self-sufficient in food, hence the uh, pictures of starvation that you see, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, f from Africa, even though Africa is theoretically, uh, you know, the richest continent. Uh, one of um, one of the things I wanted to raise is uh, what, uh, if anything, is happening either at the governmental or grassroots level to you know to deal with this problem. Even though, uh, even though I think one of y'all alluded to it, that you know cer certain you know uh, managers have been killed, you know, in the process of trying to extract these resources. Take one more question. Yeah. Uh, I like to make a comment on uh, Chinese. Uh, as I see it here, uh, the theme sounds good. It's about economic growth. <coughs> ecology transformation. But never mind on this, you see complete distraction. You saw about Chinese. They are faceless, shameless, what they did to Ethiopian, the Ethiopian, the land crowd, and all the people are kicked out, and some of them dislocated, some of them are refugee, I've done about refugee, I'm not representing anybody, but I'm a researcher. You know, I'm an independent researcher. You can log my name and look Google, you know. And tell, tell us your name and organization if you've got There is no organization as such. I am an independent writer, researcher, but I'm telling the audience to know about this. At least there is no lip service with Chinese, you know. Human rights, never mind, you know, forget this and that. And who are the rulers? They are Dictators, you know, dictators means maybe we don't know. I've been here since 72. I know what democracy means. I know what right means. A dictator means, you know, as you said something, you're gone. You're gone the next day. And uh, 
the poor kitten, they have no voice, they are voiceless, and they are harassed, the women, the children. You know, it's not like a party, this uh, pep talk here and there, you know. This is something serious, people's life. And they are destroying. The moment they leave the flower plant, and that land need to rejuvenate at least another 40, 50 years, you know, the land to be claimed. They even go to the extent to monastery, to the church, to build sugar. I'm sure you heard some of them, you know, unless you deny, you know. They do, they did, in the monastery. They kicked out the monk and so on, they went to build sugar. And what the heck, you know, there is plenty of land. The Nile, you know, and so They're talking about the Nile, this and that, the tributaries are given to Indian, to Chinese, and so on. They're the one who do the irrigation, the small irrigation, which the Ethiopian poor farmers can do, you know. It's just for fairness disease, to spread the world, you know, the world, you know. Uh, I know I know, American people are fair, and, you know, uh, they don't want the child to die, they don't want the mother, I mean, getting uh, here and there, kickback is something, World Bank, this and that, may help the Chinese. It look like Chinese get pat on the back and say, keep on, you're doing the right thing, you know, continue. You know, that's, that's unfair, you know. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Let's hear some, and then we'll take some more comments. Okay. So let's go some responses. Sure, I'm trying on, on these. Uh, first off, on the whole issue of, of the, the, this uh, grab, the race for what's left, as Michael Clare puts it, the, the global race for resources, I think, yeah, there, there is a real possibility of, uh, of significant um, uh, potential problems uh, between China and the United States. The China is, is trying to develop its uh, advanced military capability. The United States has already said that they've already started to shift resources to the Pacific uh, to, uh, to try to counter it. There already are disagreements with the Chinese and Japan and Taiwan and the Philippines, not Taiwan, the Philippines and uh, Malaysia, if I'm not mistaken, on, on who, who, oh, who controls the sea in certain areas. Uh, and uh, so I say that's, that, is, uh, that is something that is a real possibility in the future. There's been stuff being written about this for quite a few years, about the potential, and, and I think we're just seeing the very, very beginning of it now. Um, on, on the issue of, uh, someone raised the question about uh, food self-sufficiency, and, and, and it goes in with the land grabs uh, in Africa. By the way, I, it's my understanding the Chinese are not particularly egregious. They're not any better than anybody else, but they're not the most numerous as far as the, la the land grabs. They don't, they don't control most of the territory that has been grabbed. Uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, the last I saw, most of that was private capital. And a lot of that was British. E European. Uh, British. European, yes. European, excuse me, yes. Yeah. And most of that was Especially European. British. That's right. Yeah. And most of that was for, bio, for biofuel production, so-called mm -hmm. biofuel production, so that, mm -hmm. the, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. the Europeans should be able to have a nice conscience and, and uh, be able to have uh, green, right. so-called green uh, biodiesel. So, uh, so I, I, I don't see this, uh, this being, uh, I, I see it is a problem. It's a major problem. And before that, by the way, the Africans bought into just like what happened in Jamaica. They bought into the the whole neoliberal ideology, which, with regard to agriculture and other issues, also was just get the government out of agriculture. Stop subsidizing fertilizers. You folks in was it Malawi or Ethiopia? I've forgotten. Do away with government uh, uh, sponsored uh, grain storage facilities. Uh, get the government out of everything. And they did it. And part of this was uh, done through being forced to do it, and part of it was being done because this was the ideology, and this is what you did. And they had economics students, uh, people came back from uh, the United States or came back from Europe and said, yeah, this is the right way to do it. And you had a tremendous hit on African agriculture, just tremendous. And, uh, and Malawi was, I think, the first to recognize this and has tried, tried to reverse it. Uh, this particular issue is at least okay. You know, in other words, what, what, what was happening, what the IMF was saying, the World Bank and the U.S. government, by the way, and the NGOs from the United States was, was saying, don't do what the United States does. Don't do what Europe does. Don't do what Japan does. You should do. It's much better not to do that. Much better to do it this way. 
completely privatize everything, get the government out of agriculture. And, and this was an absolutely disastrous situation. So, so, uh, so with, with regard to the land grabs, and, and I think the last comment, uh, I think, I, I, you know, the United States has worked with dictators historically. We've mm -hmm. helped to install dictators. We've worked with these dictators until they become no use to us. And then we might turn against them. Uh, so I don't think the Chinese are any worse, maybe not any better, but I don't think they're any worse than, uh, than the other uh, countries uh, that have uh, had these types of relationships with the poorer countries in the world. And uh, it, it, it really just isn't China, and China isn't the main one, especially with regard to the land grabs in Africa. That doesn't, I wouldn't say it morally absolves them, but, but it's still, uh, the reality is that that, that, that is the, the situation. Um, anyhow. Richard? Yeah. Uh, I, I would just say that, uh, yes, sir, Fred is absolutely right. Certainly, both in the scale of China's investments in Africa, uh, the scale of them relative to historic scale of investments by and control by European um, uh, countries, co colonial countries, uh, they're still small potatoes. Um, and, uh, and certainly by European standards, in, in China's China's behavior in Africa certainly is nowhere near the the level of brutality that you know the Belgians and uh, French and other countries uh, deployed in Africa. They're not chopping the hands off of workers who peasants who don't pay taxes and so forth. Um, however, at this point in time, Western corporations are um, unfortunately, from their from, the, from their point of view, restrained to a certain extent by international laws, by um, like there are laws in this country against uh, bribing, direct bribing, they can't do that, they can get, you know, fined or, you know, they can run into all kinds of problems. So they, the U.S. corporations are, are somewhat restrained by those, by those international and national um, um, s structures and, and prohibitions, which doesn't mean that'll always last, it doesn't mean they don't violate it, but, but at least for the moment right now, that uh, the Chinese are in a completely different situation. They're not signatories to any of this stuff. They're happy to bribe anybody they can, and they and they uh, they are, uh, go in there with uh, big wads of cash, like the Americans go into Afghanistan. Um, they they go in there with big wads of cash, and they're happy to buy off everybody they can and get whatever they want. So right now they're playing a particularly uh, uh, bad role in that uh, in that particular de in their development there. That's the first thing. The second thing is the is the potential down the line because. I think that China is just um, ch just growing at a the, the Chinese investment overseas is really really taking off <laughs> a lot of money to spend, and um, I think it'll be a much bigger player on the scene here in a, in, in a while uh, than um, um, than uh, maybe even the U.S. in many areas of the world. They're not just investing in, ch in in China; they're investing all over the place in Latin America and even in Europe. So. They're, they're uh, coming on stream here as very big imperial powers, uh, um, uh, proto-imperial power, and um, and um, they're, they're going to and they um, you know they're helping to um, I he hesitate to say this lower the standards around the world here, uh, given the U.S. history and European history or so forth. But the few gains that people have won over the last you know few half century or so, a couple of cent last century or so are being steadily whittled away by mm. both um, Americans and so forth, you know, disregarding their own laws. And, um, and the Chinese, who are just completely outside the picture, don't care about those in the first place. Mm. So. Before we go back to the floor, just a, a question on restraint, because you talk about uh, restraint, European, American. Uh, I, I, can, I can come here and talk loud. Uh, but, you know, a restraint by some of these laws and international and domestic uh, but isn't it also uh, restrained in some ways by the West's own economic problems yeah. and inefficiencies? Yeah. In, in some ways, that's a greater restraint, I think, which China doesn't suffer from. Well, except, know, except that there's plenty of capital they don't know what to do with. Hmm. You know, the United States companies are sitting on internally in the United States, I don't know, what is it, one to two billion dollars uh, billion, excuse me. Trillion. Yeah. Trillion. Yeah, yeah. Trillion. yeah, billion is, is nothing. You know, I mean, a yeah. billion used to billion. be something. To be something. And, and, uh, and if you count all the international, you know, all the money that they've got stored overseas, uh, I'm talking about U.S. companies. Right. These are profits that they have right. stored. You're talking three to four billion. And so, uh, trillion. Trillion. trillion, excuse me, excuse me. My goodness, my goodness. 
So, uh, so th there's plenty of capital. You know, that's not the issue. It's a question of finding profitable places to, to deploy that capital, as they say, uh, to use it so that they can get investment re return on it. So, uh, so I don't think, I mean, I, I think it is, though, an indication to a certain extent of the loss of American power. Mm. And I think, I, think, I think American power has been decreased uh, significantly since the Vietnam War. Mm. And, I mean, there was a short period of time when the United States was, was really it. Uh, and I mean, there were constraints on it, the Soviet Union and China, certainly. But uh, in the in the capitalist world, the, the after World War II, uh, the, the United States took complete and unilateral leadership. Mm. And now I think uh, it's uh, it's it's having problems politically abroad. It's, it's having problems economically, internally, uh, and uh, and in projecting its power, uh, it still has the strength to do it. But I think there will be more restraints yeah. put on it. You know, even uh, you know, the, uh, the Afghani's are not terribly yeah, yeah. happy with the, the way they're behaving, uh, the way the U.S. troops are behaving, and and so th I think they're, uh, I think we're seeing the potential for more challenges for U.S. power. No disagreement there. It's just are those yeah. restraints primarily legalistic ones, no, or are they coming from yeah. that? All right. So um, let's go across in this direction. I'll start us off. Uh, Tell us who you are. My name is uh, Claire Hirsch. And I was one of the founding members of the U.S.-China People's Friends Association. And as such, I visited China in 1972. And I, in a few words, I came back saying, I've seen the future and it works. Um, I have since then learned uh, over the years that every country's foreign policy is totally self-serving. Um, uh, in answer to what was said before, um, the fact that China is perhaps more brutal in its uh, being exposing uh, its imperialism is it's not hampered by tradition of bourgeois democracy, you know, it's something that you said. So in effect, it's probably more dangerous than any imperialism or more destructive than any imperialism has been before. Yeah, <clears throat> it's very important to understand the Chinese way of doing things. I was in Ethiopia recently. It's very hard to believe that if people went to grocery to buy food, for example, simple, I will give you celery comes with, in the uh, box. They carry about six or seven boxes. They take away all of them. Then I asked the supermarket owner, why should they take all of them? What? other people should buy and eat. He said, what can I say? Tell them we have to have a share for other people also. They, are, they should not carry all of them. They come and wipe out most of the things there. I don't understand why they do that. One. Two. The government is putting spy instruments, or what they call satellites. In Ethiopia, they have an instrument that blocks every passing radio to the people. You can send a radio or anything, but they block that. The fourth one, about land grab. Yes. It's, you know, many of you know Ethiopia is a very hungry country. And uh, on the world media, I'm sure many of you know. but. I will tell you that Ethiopia is one of the richest country. Potentially can feed double of today's people, about 80 something million. Now it can feed 160 million people. But unfortunately, the country do not have good leader. Dictator, monarch, dictator, military dictator, now this racist came now, he died, he passed away, the uh, other one is replacing. So they collaborate with this government, the Chinese government, and the Ethiopian government, do harm to the land and to the people. 
So how should we stop? I believe they are planning to replace many many Chinese to bring there and put them to work in the name of work. But certainly they will get multiplied at the moment they will take over because they are majority, they will be majority. That's one of my fears. They did it in one of the Oceania Islands. So I see, I observed this and I told them the people should say, no, don't do this. And sometimes there is a street fighting for your information. The people will say, no, don't do this. They don't care about it. They go, they have it. I'm sure you remember there is what is called ZEIT. Z-E-I-T is a kind of uh, instrument that they use for like, it's a small uh, USB, USB port like, but they use for uh, internet. In, in fact, they use, they use that for spy also. So if they're harming the people in Africa, and Africans will rise up against them. They are not di directed, directly, they are harming the people. Thank but, you. Let's, thank you. Um, so we're looking at the clock, and I see four of the hands up. I'm not sure if we can take all of you, but let's see if we can get questions out quickly and get some responses. Now I see five. All right. Uh, I have two questions for Fred. Um, one is a general one. Um, you felt the need to focus on Africa somewhat because Teresa wasn't here. But I wondered if your expertise in agriculture and science, and as well as capitalism, whether you had some general overarching kind of um, contribution to make to the general topic. And secondly, you mentioned that you had uh, some disagreements with what Richard had said. So I wonder if you could raise them and we could have a little discussion about that. In two minutes. Gentlemen, <laughs> should we take, see if we take all the remaining hands up and then you guys yeah. can yeah. give yeah. your responses? Fine. Fine. All right, let's just go straight across. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Tell us who you are. My name is Danny Lewis, and I have one question for Fred and one for Richard. For Fred, uh, in, in the context of this uh, accelerating investment boom in Africa, how do you see it as related to the various wars that are going on in Africa right now? Uh, you, you didn't mention that in your presentation, and you know I think we all know that, it, especially in the Congo, there is you know a, an enormously destructive and long-running war that has taken millions of lives, and there are many other wars going on. And, and how how are these two things articulated? <coughs> and for Richard, uh, looking sort of into the uh, Chinese future, uh, do you foresee the possibility of? accelerating uh, conflict with the established imperialist powers, especially the U.S., as the Chinese regime tries to, as they put it, move up the value chain. That is to say, uh, instead of focusing on uh, the export platform, uh, actually um, compete with the imperialist centers with advanced, advanced technology products. You know, and and uh, you know, what, what are the prospects you know, for a greater conflict in the, uh, the world capitalist market between you know, the, the established centers and, and ascended China? And, and also, do you think that there's, do you foresee the, uh, the possibility that uh, the private sector in China over time may become stronger and, and gradually eat up or dissolve the state sector, which, which runs the show now, as you described? Mitchell? Yeah. Um, one of the consequences of, of the U.S. invasion of Somalia in 92 was the imposed imposition of genetically engineered cassava, which is, goes in the wake of U.S. interventions everywhere. Right now, there's this, as the other day, I, I read a report, an AP report, that there's a huge cassava uh, it's dying out. There's a huge blight going all the way across this main staple in, in Africa. So, uh, and it's almost all the plants they predict will be wiped out everywhere, which will lead to a, just a dramatic worsening of the hunger situation and so forth. So what do you see as the, I mean, but this provides an opportunity <laughs> for imperialist countries and for other forces to go in there and take advantage of it in one way or another. So what ways do you see that happening, uh, if you can? And I just note that Zambia was 
the country that blocked uh, the U.S. care, or it wasn't care, but the USAID packages because of their genetically engineered con content and scuttled the whole WTO agreement in Seattle in 99, which is why the movement was so successful there. So I wanted to love some comments on that. The last two, very quickly. Won't peak oil kind of put the skids to all this? I mean, they peaked in 2006, two, two, between two, 2004 and 2006, and said that world oil production, easy oil, has peaked, and it's going to begin declining. The other side of the cliff is pretty steep. Won't it just put the skids to a lot of this development issues? <clears throat> Last question. Hi, I'm Shannon from UC Berkeley. Hi, thanks very much for your talk. Um, so it seems to me like there are two um, tendencies here, right? One is the Chinese capitalist is behaving just like a capitalist in Africa and other places, but also at the same time, and the you know, bureaucrat bureaucratic collectivist capitalism, so you know, there are particular tendencies and particularly disruptive uh, sort of tendencies um, at home as well. So it seems to me that the big question here is in regards to the character of uh, Chinese capitalists, that is it going to be sort of more merging with global capital uh, due to all these interpenetrations of uh, capitalists and then does it just become like a global capital behaving in a capitalist way or is it going to be more of a distinctive block of national Chinese capital because of uh, the, the state's control, um, continued control of the commanding heights of the economy and what's the implications of that on the extraction resources? Great, thank you all. Great questions and great comments. We're going to hear closing comments and try to wrap up on time. Fred, you start us off. We've been told we have four minutes each, and there, there's no way that, that we can answer. <laughs> any one of those. Yeah, and, and almost any one of those. Those are great questions. However, however they are good questions. after we're officially done, we can keep talking. They, they are good questions. Uh, I would like to just uh, pick up on a couple of themes. Uh, and one is, I think there's a misunderstanding of what China was like in the 1970s and what China was like before the transition uh, in the, in the um, uh, to the to, to to a capital style uh, uh, system. Uh, those I, I don't have a chance to go into it. But those who want to get a, a different side of what was going on during the Cultural Revolution, take a look at Han Dong Ping's book, mm -hmm. The Unknown Cultural Revolution. Although he goes now by Dong Ping Han because he's in America, so he's changed mm -hmm. his his last name to be at the end. What's it called? Uh, the Unknown um, Cultural Revolution. It's M MR published it after someone else let the publication rights go. But, uh, but uh, there was a thriving agriculture in China. There was, there was development, nothing like the increases that happened afterwards, but it was not shabby. It was not stagnant. American agronomists who visited China were flabbergasted this during the Cultural Revolution by what they saw with regard to food production in China. And, and I have material on that if anybody's interested. With regard to food, I think one of the things to keep in mind is there is enough food right now produced in the world to feed everybody. Yep. There's enough food produced globally. I'm not saying in every country necessarily, and, but we can see right here there's more than enough food in the United States to feed everybody, and yet we've got 50 million people that are considered to be food insecure, 17 million people that are considered to be very food insecure. We know how to grow food in Ethiopia in an environmentally sound way so that everybody can have a healthy diet. It can be done. <coughs> but you need, this is, the t this is exactly where you need governments to help out you know, to help out with, the, with the, these uh, environmentally sound technologies versus the technologies that come from, you know, from abroad. Uh, I mean, I have a lot more to say about this and about what those technologies are and how they do it, and, and some countries are trying it. There are small-scale projects in a number of countries <coughs> that are focusing, and I think that is the answer, is the small-scale issue. Because one of the major issues, and I'll end with this, so don't panic if I'm running over four minutes, but one of the major issues in the world <coughs> is what is going to happen to all the people displaced from peasant agriculture, all right? We now have about half the people living in cities in the world, half living in the rural areas. We have one point, I don't know how many billion people, 1.5 billion people approximately, actively involved in agriculture. Samir Amin estimated, and I think it's an underestimate, that if you had a fully capitalized, large-scale capitalist agriculture, all you'd need would be 20 million farmers mm. to produce all the food for the mm. world. <coughs> What's going to happen to the 1.4 billion people? Where are they going to go? How are they going to make a living? There's no jobs for them in the slums mm. of, of Nigeria or the slums of wherever. So this is a really critical issue of keeping people on the land, 
having them become much more productive. Small-scale agriculture can be highly productive from the point of view of yields per acre or per hectare. It's more labor-intensive, for sure, but the actual amount of food that gets produced per land area can be higher, as high or higher than in, in, in a uh, highly mechanized industrial-style agriculture. Um, well, just, well the, you know, same problem, but I'll, I'll just uh, say one thing about Danny, I don't have a crystal ball about the future of Chinese bureaucratic collectivist capitalism or whatever, so I don't know. But I would just say that for the moment, uh, it plays a role in, in hastening the process of primitive accumulation over the whole planet now, in a way. Because, you know, in the past, there were investments by Europeans in. Um, um, agriculture and so forth. This is also going by, driven by, agri by European uh, 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 companies too. It's in league with them and, uh, the, in, in, in Africa, but they weren't very largely. The Belgians like weren't very successful in, in, in setting up plantations and so forth. You know, they didn't work very well. Agricultural land wasn't so was so suitable for the kinds of crops they wanted to grow in, in Africa. So those those m kind of wilted on the vine, and most of the exploitation of Africa was minerals and and uh, things like that. But now there is a full scale onslaught on the appropriation of African lands and the expulsion of these people. It's real, we're talking about primitive Kivish, a whole continent, vast areas that people, people are going to lose their land exactly as Fred said and be driven into the cities in, in, a, in a way that has not happened in Africa before, but has happened in, of course, America and many other places where primitive accumulation has been fully pulled out, uh, carried out. So that, that, is a, that, that is a real, uh, a real problem. And, I, and, I, and I'd say it's not just there, too, because the Chinese, the particular character of Chinese investment, where they, where they also bring in their own labor power because they have so much of it and it's so cheap. They're, gonna che they're even cheaper to bring in Chinese workers than to pay, uh, pay African workers sometimes, but especially also in Europe where, I mean, I spent a little time in Italy a couple of years ago and got to see a little bit of how, how um, the Chinese bring in like tens of thousands of workers to, to set up a shoe industry or, or a garment industry and so forth, basically driving out of production the local small businesses. Europe, I mean, Europe still has, Italy especially has, lots of small businesses, which, which uh, small artisanal industries and so forth, and they're, they're, they're really kind of, I don't know, they're, they're beautiful, but they're kind of antique in a way, and they're holding on by a, a thread, and they're being driven out of business and replaced by cheap production. But not just cheap production imports from China, but actually the Chinese are making it in Europe. You know, mm -hmm. so it's a really destructive process for uh, and you know f uh, for destroying all kinds of small scale um, uh, businesses, life lifestyles, and so forth of people. It's really sad. I, I find it very unfortunate. But that's happening everywhere, and um, it's a, for for the foreseeable future, uh, Danny. It's a kind an unstoppable machine, I don't know. But we are driving ourselves over the cliff of ecological collapse. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't mention this, but I'm finishing a book on capitalism and ecological collapse um, and the eco-socialist alternative. So, um, and uh, people can look at articles which are chapter drafts in, on Real World Economics Review, you know, if mm -hmm. you go to their, um, my article on green capitalism and, and stuff like that. Anyway. Um, Th that's where we're headed. It's really um, all of this is part and parcel of an ongoing overdevelopment of every piece of land in, <laughs> in the planet, and it's really driving us off the cliff. I just uh, I don't know where it's all going to end. Mm, 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 mm. Not the friendliest and happiest uh, final <laughs> note, but more <laughs> more space for further conversation. Thank all of you, and especially let's give some thanks to some very intense and very wonderful presentations. Thank you. Thank you.